Hey guys, so I started watching this video a few minutes ago and I found it quite interesting so I thought I'd do a video on it. So as you can see, I think you can see on here that I've got to about here in the video. So all of this I haven't seen. Um, but Jurassic World Dominion, How a Movie Ruined Itself, Anatomy of a Failure by Filmento. Um, I've never really watched their videos before so uh, I don't really know what to expect except for what I've just watched. Um, but yeah, I, I, there's some things to say about this and it's an interesting look at the divide between this people in this movie and I think I figured something out so this video brought to you by Ridge Wallet use code Flamento to save 10% with free international shipping but mainly he's exploiting your enchantment with these you don't care you know exactly what you're doing but you won't cool stop scene. you can't is there an actual concern here or are you just there is not Passion, there is no vision, there is no aggression, there is no mindset, nothing is there. What the hell is that? After years and years of waiting, Jurassic World Dominion finally lives up to the title of this franchise reboot, in that at long last we're exploring the topic of dinosaurs inhabiting the world with humans. Except, oh wait, in this movie, Apple and CEO Tim Cook have bought the dinosaurs and taken them to this remote nature reserve, meaning that once again, we're in a park. Well, maybe next time. Super smart. So that's not necessarily true. Um, the locusts that are causing a global problem which he brings up in a minute is the other main plot of the movie involving the legacy cast is a global issue and those locusts are infused with cre uh, cretaceous dna i believe so it's still from the prehistoric time period so the title jurassic world still applies because the locusts are causing an issue they may not be dinosaurs but it doesn't need to be dinosaurs to make the same point uh, that you could make with the dinosaurs. I know he, he has some issues coming up in the section where I basically pause to record this video about how the locust subplot is boring, but we'll get to that. Um, but the, the title, Jurassic World, still stands. It's not Jurassic Park, because there is the whole Bias in Valley section, but that's towards the very end of the movie. Lots of the movie is spent on the mainland and seeing the like building global threat of everything, basically. But snarky comments aside though, there is a lot of good stuff here in the plotline led by Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard the new they stuff. go on this journey of necessity to get back their kidnapped MacGuffin daughter. For example, as is always most important in these big blockbusters, there are sequences you've never seen before to justify the price of admission, like this Malta sequence which I really applaud the filmmakers for. We get a hand-to-hand -hand combat scene with dinosaurs mixing up the dynamics. <laughs> We get a born like roof <laughs> after chasing with the dinosaurs mixing up the dynamics. Jesus Christ, that's Jason Bourne. We get an urban motor chase scene <laughs> like with weaponized joke. raptors mixing up the dynamics. I mean, there's even a guy who gets eaten on a scoot. Not scoot. only is this super exciting, but you've never seen it before. So overall, I can safely say that Jurassic World Dominion is a pretty damn good movie. Stop the cow! <laughs> what do you mean, stop the... What do you mean? Oh, right. So this is an important point to bring up here. So he says it's an overall good movie and then has this joke about stop the cap and he shows the Rotten Tomatoes score. But something to take note here is he's showing the critics' reviews of 30% on, based on 380 reviews, which is a really relatively small pool of reviewers. Uh, but then he's cutting out the audience score, which, as I looked up uh, just before recording, is currently sat at 77 percent so why has he cut that out he doesn't want to show that the audience actually likes it and it's they're in the majority like the majority of people like the movie or does he look at rotten tomatoes and think well let's factor in the critics reviews of 30 percent into the 77 percent minus the 30 percent to 47 percent which then puts it at this very interesting place which i thought was of of worth making a video about on this topic that it sits sort of just under the halfway mark which means then the people who don't like the movie also have the incentive that they're in the majority but the people who like the movie if you split split them up the majority of people like the movie more than the critics so but why are they separate 
That's what I think. I think there's an incentive for people who really like the movie to say we're in the majority. But then Rotten Tomatoes makes it like unravels it to the point where the people who don't like the movie think they're in the majority. So that's where you get the divide between fans who like the movie and who, who don't like the movie. That's it. That like when they use Rotten Tomatoes as a sort of I don't know ammo against or for the movie. I just thought that was a really interesting thing that uh, I stumbled upon when watching this. But let's continue. Yeah, so unfortunately, in addition to the Chris Pratt plotline, there is also another plotline starring legacy characters from the original movie, where essentially they're trying to prove that Apple is using juiced up locusts to eat all the corn. And not only is this plotline not entertaining, it's also so boring to watch that doing so feels like work to a point where... <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> so this is this is where i got up to because i thought that was so funny it's so boring it feels like work well go to work go to work learn go see what they're talking about it's more interesting because it's for me it's interesting because it's like in the book this kind of stuff is going on not this exactly but the, the cut from the same cloth there's it's so much about genetic tampering and and the global effects of it i thought adding the in insect plot line was quite interesting and really refreshing so like whilst he was kind of complaining about the bison valley being like jurassic park you know with alan and ellie going there to investigate the locust he's ignoring that the the actual through plot line of that one is actually more refreshing and new than the whether he was being serious or not i'm not quite sure because it did end in a joke but like the whole like praising the Malta sequence for being new and fresh. The Locust thing is even newer than that, like in, in terms of how cutting edge it is. And I think that that sort of push over the familiar a little bit maybe threw some people off. So, but I don't know, there's the divide there because I found that really fascinating. That was my what, favorite aspect of the new movie was like this different aspect to genetic tampering gone awry. And I thought it was quite poetic if I have to be the romantic, in saying that, like, I think because the dinosaurs were born from DNA found in mosquitoes in the very first movie, and they had this the whole exposition to do with that, that it was quite nice to round off the, the Jurassic era, the story, with uh, the insects being a problem. So, yeah. This movie should be free. You know, I pay $12 to get to watch this, and then I get paid back $12 for also having to watch this. In other words, Jurassic World Dominion is an under two hour movie that the legacy plotline bloats up into a two and a half hour snore fest, almost like a malignant tumor destroying its healthy host. And so today, what I, th I think that's really harsh on the movie. <laughs> I thought for an editing challenge alone, like from a filmmaking standpoint, it's it's. Well, I mean, I think Trevorrow even said it in an interview that he was like using this kind of Lord of the Rings model of showing two plot lines. Well, I mean, Lord of the Rings has like three or four, and that's a three-hour movie. This is two hours forty, so it has two. So there's like twenty minutes cut for the other plot line that they could have introduced if they were Lord of the Rings. But yeah, the, this I thought they balanced it quite well. But that's just a difference of opinion there. I thought it would be useful to do is to compare these two plot lines from beginning to end to see what it is that makes the second one not good. What's missing? What should be missing? And so on and so on. Here's how to know that your plot... It's kind of the irony that this guy's complaining about the legacy cast rather than the new one. I find that kind of interesting. <laughs> plot line isn't strong enough to be in... Because one would assume the old cast, that legacy storyline, that would be the thing that excites people that they're, they've returned. I mean, it's certainly excited me as a fan, but um, but I also like the world plotline a lot as well because, it's, as he's saying, that it's like quite fresh. So I guess he wasn't joking. Included in your movie and should be cut out like a tumor. Here's how Jurassic World Dominion, for no reason, destroyed itself. That's a long intro. The first main issue with the legacy plotline is that it's completely untouched by the drama created by the movie setting. As an opposite example of this for comparison, if you look at the Chris Pratt storyline, you can immediately find drama in many different forms. There's internal conflict with the genetically altered girl struggling with not being able to live her life because of what she is. There's the isolated cold setting, just want to add that, like, he's right, there's, 
this uh, cold setting. They're isolated. They're alone. They're exiled from society because of what happened in the previous movie, which makes complete sense. And even just the visuals alone adds that weight to the world storyline more than the legacy cast to begin with. You sure you didn't go past the bridge? Why can't I have any freedom? Because you can't. Which then manifests as external conflict with the girl lashing out against her quote-unquote parents responsible for keeping her safe. I'm not angry. How would I know what people do? <laughs> the only people I've spoken to in the past four years are you both. You can't keep me here, you're not my mother. Their mom <laughs> I, I would genuinely love if she did have a radio on playing that kind of music. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> that like captures that teenage angst so perfectly. <laughs> it's almost like a stereotype. That's brilliant. Moments of danger and opposition with information <laughs> mixed in. We had a baby. That's impossible. There's an underlying antagonistic force pushing against us. There's a problem that requires urgent action to be solved. There's a sense of challenge where the characters need to overcome this wall that directly concerns them. Overall, there is drama. Whether that drama is good or not, that's up to you. But the point is that it's there. There is some level of narrative and cinematic value in what we're watching. Can we start over? I know, Claire. Yes. There are people out there who'll do anything to find me. Whereas in the legacy storyline, <laughs> I love for it. the longest time, there's <laughs> nothing. Essentially, we get this scene of these buffed up locusts attacking some random kids at a farm. And then afterwards, the doctor from the first movie, Ellie Sattler, shows up to see what's going on. And is there any kind of danger or hostility to getting that information? No, the locusts are already gone and the farm lady just explains it. That's not- what? <laughs> yeah, the locusts have gone. They're going global. <laughs> like, they're eating all the crops. They're slow- well, not slowly, in, in relatively fast. They're eating away all the crops. <laughs> what does he- what do you mean there's no drama? It's a it's slow build to the drama in this one. This is the first scene we get context for any of this. So and he's acting like it's a scene that's coming later. Like when you start a movie, like the original Jurassic Park had that one bit of drama scene at the start, and then a lot of it was build up. That's that's what they're modeling that storyline on. Right? It's a sequel. Planet corn. The locust didn't meet that. We are independent. They use biosyn seed. You caught a live one? After that, Ellie goes to see another doctor from the original movie, Alan Grant, to get his help. And is there any kind of underlying conflict here between them to add drama to this interaction? No, they just nicely talk about their lives and how they never ended up banging. Well, funding's dried up, so somebody's gotta pay for all this. I read your articles. It's soil science and regenerative farming. How are you kids? Mm. Amazing. Grown. It's shocking. They're both in college. Can you believe that? And Mark? It's over. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. It's okay. I'm back to me. My work, you know, it's... That's great. That's good. It is. And then they look at one of the locusts, which again is already in a cage and has no other role in the scene other than being a source of discussion. Then they need to get into the remote Apple facility to prove that they're behind the locust attack. Not because it somehow concerns them personally, but because they might as well. Yeah, why not? Uh, but no, yes, it does concern them personally. Ellie says, she's talking about there's a global catastrophe about to happen that will affect everyone. Everyone. Once the farmlands are depleted because of these locusts, your cows are going to die because, as they said, there's a cascading effect. If all the crops get eaten up by these locusts and you can't, and they're out of control and there's nothing you can do about it, the cows are going to die, all the farm animals are going to die, and then we don't have food. Like, it's, it, there's, there's this huge change coming that we could avoid by destroying the locusts. It affects Ellie, it affects Alan. Alan knows this, but he also likes Ellie, so he's he's getting he's having his cake and eating it, one would say. And in this very shot, Ramsay is secretly, we find out, working with Ellie to try and and Malcolm to try and get the well, I mean, Ellie doesn't know, but he's the one who kickstarted this whole thing off. It's uh, the inverse of Jurassic Park, because Dennis Nedry tried to steal embryos for Biosyn and Dodson in the first film. And is the irony coming round, karma coming round by uh, Dodson in the ass because he then has an employee who betrays him. It's a sequel. Like, they do the same thing, but they change the context. Everyone who's been watching my YouTube channel knows that, that I bring that up all the time. But, like, if you remove the context, sure, it's like you, you're boiling it down. But with the context, it kind of changes the dynamic of 
seeing the same thing sort of repeated but in a new way repackaged and resold it's what sequels do that's why it's a sequel it's the nature of sequels there's only a handful of sequels that don't do that and they are either really bad or really good so a lot of sequels as I bring up like Aliens is a beloved movie as a sequel Terminator 2 is a beloved sequel you know and by most people funnily enough both made by James Cameron um both those movies are beloved but they do the exact same thing in terms of changing the context but repackaging and reselling you the same idea from the original film I just don't I'd never and I guess this is what I do on my channel a lot I'm trying to work out like why that bugs some people I still don't understand it but hey let's continue let's see which isn't much of a challenge anyway because they've already been invited and thus in the scenes that follow there is no kind of opposition either they hang around in an airport petting dinosaurs as they're waiting for their ride they hang around in a plane talking about day they hang around in an airport where dinosaurs are being cleaned but in that scene you're also seeing how people are reacting to the dinosaurs that are, have been captured out in the wild they're looking after them they're cleaning them they're trying to send them off to the sanctuary there's a lot of uh, visual context there for the world building that, you know, the governments are not saying let's completely destroy these animals. They still have their rights, even though they've got on the mainland, which, um, you know, <laughs> you know, the government in Fallen Kingdom decided not to go to the island to save the dinosaurs. And they said, you know, it's an act of God. You know, we're going to go that route. And then in the next film, you realize that maybe if they truly believed that it was an act of God, and that's what they were telling people that God brought the dinosaurs back around onto the mainland as kind of, I don't know, punishment or a way of uh, seeking redemption for humans. Like, we have to coexist with them. Like, we have to live with our mistake. That That's the whole point of that scene. Like, it's not just Alan and Ellie going to the airport. If you really see the background, like, you're looking a bit at it and the wider picture of what these movies were doing in terms of building a uh, sort of an overall arc of a story um, the visuals are just as important as what the characters are doing there's a lot going on in that scene is basically what I'm saying dangerous dinosaurs that they don't actually have to worry about and then they hang around watching lectures and talking with Apple CEO Tim Cook and so on so on would you mind if we um, uh, just oh. to, it would mean a lot if... uh, do you want to um... oh great thank you so much oh uh... That, that's good, that's good, thanks. So I'm sure you get the idea, but the point is that these scenes are so void of any kind of dramatic value that they ultimately carry no value whatsoever. It's as if the movie... Totally disagree. Totally disagree. <laughs> ...expects us to be entertained just because, you know, it's the characters from the original. You said you Oh, yeah. It's like... Get over yourself, you don't have a Han Solo here. And even if you did, it's not the character that creates the value, but rather the drama. Maybe, maybe he isn't a Jurassic Park franchise fan. Maybe he isn't, because to a lot of us fans of this franchise, Alan Grant is like our Han Solo. Like, he's a really loved character within the fandom. In in people. My mum loved the fact that Alan Grant was back. My nan was even like, oh, they're back, are they? <laughs> like, there, there was, there's a, I don't know, is it a generational thing? Again? I don't know. Drama. I don't get it. It's just a, we have to agree to disagree. Uh, that you can mine with the character. I mean, the reason Jeff Goldblum has immediately much more value than the other two is because at least when he's on screen, something is actually happening. And so, because there is no drama prior to that whatsoever, you could have just deleted all this boring loitering from the script that weighs down the whole thing. You know the film Titanic? Why didn't they just start the film with the ship hitting the iceberg? Why didn't they do that? What's all that boring hour and a half of just sitting on a ship, talking, singing hymns, you know, having sex, drawing naked ladies, like what? <laughs> <laughs> What's this guy's problem with build-up in story? Like, what is it? Is it? Is his problem with that? And I'm going to assume this is it, right? That he he likes the action of the world thing, and then when he when you cut to this, that becomes boring. 
I guess it's just that, right? The, just that they've got these two plots rather than one. And instead begun with Jeff Goldblum having infiltrated the Apple facility. This guy just really hates dual, dual plots. <laughs> it, it, every film has to be linear. There's no, no thinking outside the box in that in that regard. The locust attacks. As a result, nothing of value would have been lost. Just the opposite. You would have saved minutes upon minutes of screen time. You would have saved millions upon billions of dollars worth of shooting days. And most of all, you would have saved my nerves. Hang on a second. Save millions and millions of dollars. It's just past one billion at the global box office. This movie's a huge hit. Jurassic, the Jurassic Park franchise, here, here's a little fact to chew on. The Jurassic Park franchise is, as far as I'm aware, the only live action movie series that averages one billion revenue with every chapter, with all six movies. Like, there's no other live action franchise that does that. There's animation franchises that do that. I could be wrong, but I think Minions is one of them. Toy Story. But, yeah. The second issue with the legacy plotline is that when there finally is some drama and challenge, it's way too relatively easy to take seriously. As an opposite example, the stuff that the characters in the other plot... <laughs> hey, hang on. It's really easy to take seriously. That's good, right? You want it. You want to take it seriously. And... You that's the whole point, right? When it goes serious, it goes serious, and it's really easy to swallow that it's now got serious. Right? What's the problem with that? The second issue with the legacy plotline is that when there finally is some drama and challenge, it's way too relatively easy to take seriously. Way As an opposite example... Way too relatively easy. I, I don't think that makes sense. <laughs> it's way too relatively. <laughs> it's relative, but it's way too relative. <laughs> easy to make to swallow that it's serious that he that is what he said right that makes no sense drama and challenge it's way too relatively easy to take seriously as an opposite example but then when he's got the pacifier in the mouth what what you want it to be hard to work out if it's being serious or not that that sounds horrible the stuff that the characters in the other plotline need to go through is quite noteworthy. They need to find out where their daughter was taken, which involves dodging T-Rexes and outrunning weaponized raptors. They need to fly into the Apple facility. Outrunning T-Rexes. I'll let that one slide. I don't think this person knows they're dinosaurs either. We've established they don't really know the, the, the level that the fans like the characters. So that's why Alan Grant is like a Han Solo. So I'm going to assume this person... I don't know. Like, they seem a little bit like a, a fan of the franchise in terms of they know the first film. But anyway. Which involves getting attacked by bird dinosaurs as well as crash landing and dealing with a water dinosaur, dinosaur. As well as parachuting down and surviving a Freddy Krueger dinosaur by hiding in murky water. Safe to say, the level of challenge is at a point where most of the audience would not survive. And he's saying this is a positive, right? So, uh, the whole Claire, uh, you know, the whole they're landing in Bison Valley, they get attacked, and there's all this tension. He's saying there's a lot of like weight to this. Uh, they've entered a new level, and guess what? It involves dinosaurs. So. That's what the fr that's what everyone wanted to see, right? Dinosaurs interacting with humans. <laughs> that's why we watch these movies, and that they did that really well. Would not survive. Whereas in the legacy plotline, it's more like the characters are playing on recruit difficulty. They need to get into the Apple facility, which happens on a red carpet. Oh, please, after you and watch your. Because Ramsey is Ramsey. What? Ramsey convinced Dodson to to invite them or Malcolm to invite them and got Mal got Malcolm's attention because he had bias and secrets that he wanted to get out. But in order to do that, they have to get Ellie and Ellie to get a sample. Like what? How is he? The red carpet is there for a reason. 
They need to find their way into the secret this crazy. focus lab for which they're given direction as well as a key. Would you guys like to tour the facilities yourselves? Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, why not? Yeah. Great. Oh, well. They need to get a sample from one of the buffed up locusts, which I guess could be a challenge, except for the fact that the movie has never shown anyone get hurt by the locusts or even really made them into a threat. Yes, they're eating all the food. They're becoming a threat. Like, it's... It's growing fast. They, they're they on like a ticking time bomb. That's a good way of looking at it. They're on a time... It's the time bomb sort of storyline. It's a bit... If they don't stop it soon, it's going to be too late. I mean, I was more worried about them in a freaking Pixar movie for little children. Then they need to escape the facility for which they once again get a red carpet. Mm -hmm. And as the last finale challenge... He's just calling Ramsey a red carpet. Doesn't he realize that Ramsey's the one who started this whole thing? For this plotline, they need to find their way through this cave with reptile dinosaurs crawling after them. Which is reptile dinosaurs. Horror, but when compared to surviving a crash landing followed by a Freddy Krueger dinosaur, not so much. You know, the cave dinosaurs are so slow and short that really all you need to do to survive them is take a step up. So the point is that whenever we're watching these legacy plotline challenges, it just feels like we're on a non-consequential commercial break from the real challenges that actually carry meaning and impact. I would say that the legacy plotline sense of challenge finally grows when it merges with the other plotline, but even there, it's more like it just drags the other plotline down with it. They go face to face with what apparently is the most dangerous apex predator in the world. Kicking out a Saurus, biggest carnivore the world has ever seen. And yet it's so passive and dumb that I feel like even I could run rings around it. Hey. It's like an animal. Not all animals are monsters that just go or after you, you know. <laughs> and the Giga does that, but at the same time, it's 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 an animal, right? You don't know what it's gonna do. It's stalking. And obviously, obviously the Giga at this point is like, there's fire coming out of the sky. Like, there's a lot going on for this animal to take in that's uh, challenging its hunting behavior. You, you don't know how these animals act. Plus, it's not real. It's a movie. <laughs> I mean, the main CEO villain here who in the other plotline initially expresses... Like, like, okay, just for the example, the amount... Oh, God, that what am I doing? Them to oh, that's a different video. So, yeah, this shot here, uh, how many people out there thought Malcolm was going to die in this scene? Because that's all I heard everyone say. I heard people were disappointed that Malcolm didn't die. But at the same time, there was that feeling of like, oh, God, they're going to kill off Malcolm in this scene. Even I felt that when I was watching it. It's like... There's, there's some tension for you. Did you not think that, sir? It's a shame, because we'll never get the answer. I mean, the main CEO villain here, who in the other plotline initially expresses unyielding determination, ultimately turns out to be nothing but a laughingstock. He has a security risk at his own facility, and yet he just lets it happen. He realizes that... He doesn't let it happen. He doesn't know it's happening. Right? There's a difference there. If he was letting it happen, that implies that he knew it was going on. But he didn't. That's why, and he didn't know where the, what was hap the cause of it, which was Ramsey. Jeff Goldblum has been playing him all along, and yet he just allows himself to be lectured by him. I'm not sure I admire your tone. You rapacious rat bastard. He accidentally sets his own company on fire in a way that doesn't even make any logical sense. Overall, he doesn't turn out to be a noteworthy antagonistic force willing to go to any lengths to get his way. Isn't that a, uh, that, that's a CGI render, isn't it? Made for no, like, the Instagram first time something. something goes wrong, he starts crying and gives up. Just call it. And it's like, that's not the first time something went wrong. There was loads going on there. He he knew Alan and Ellie were up to something. He knew Owen and Claire were on the way. He'd ordered that lady in Malta to try and kill them. He ordered the the lady to drop the the the, the defense system. So that's why the Quetzalcoatlus attacked the plane and downed the plane. Like he's been trying to actively murder the characters. So this isn't the first time it went wrong. This is when it went out of control for him. Like it went out of his, beyond his control. That's why he threw a fit. 
like, wow, what a formidable Silicon Valley foe to serve as the main challenge for this super compelling Locust plotline. Bonus, if you can't make a plotline sense of challenge in its own way reach the same level as the others, then it should not be included at all because it's just gonna bring the whole thing down. For example, once the plot- Totally disagree. Outlines unite, the movie mostly turns into a casual nostalgia circle jerk, without any sense that we might not actually make it through this. Victory! Victory! That was it's also interesting that uh, he says it was a nostalgic circle jerk, and, and a lot of fans, uh, I, I don't include myself in this, but a lot of fans out there I've heard have said the opinion that they thought there wasn't enough from the nostalgia circle jerk uh, they wanted alan and owen to talk more about raptors they wanted to see uh malcolm address Maisie being a clone like the, there was some interesting character dynamic there which i you know i think would have been cool you know i'm all for that kind of stuff um but i i don't mind how much they did in the movie because i actually thought downplaying it a bit was smart because it's kind of obvious and uh and these characters the way they word these characters i really feel like they they make them feel like they are alive like they are real people and how they would actually act they don't think like fans they don't know all the facts you know that kind of thing so when owen meets alan he says you know i watched i uh, listened to your book on tape which implies he listened to it ages ago because when were tapes a thing and um it would have been alan's first or second book after his experiences and he would have been talking about raptor communication and that is uh widely known in the fandom that that he his second book is about that and he would have learned his raptor training skills from that. Like, they, you know, that's all there in that simple line. But, you know, you have to think about it. You have to do some work. And this guy clearly, as he says, doesn't like doing work. He gets bored. In the big ending finale, they don't even have to do anything. They just run to a chopper and leave while these dinosaurs that I can barely even tell apart, aside from their DLC skin, fight <laughs> each other. And it's like, what the hell happened? Well, the second plot line happened. The third issue with the legacy plotline is that the stakes are so non-existent that it's very difficult to care about anything that happens. If you look at the other plotline- The stakes! The stakes! What? Th there's the global threat of locusts eating all the farmland. There is the dinosaurs that are still out there, so they're dealing with the fact that they have to get a Biosyn Valley in the legacy plotline. You know, there are the dinosaurs there, so that makes Alan and Ellie nervous because we know what they've been through before. So there's a bit of tension there with that. And Dodson and everything was going on with him, like all the seediness with him trying to murder people, that, that's going on at the same time. You can immediately find something to invest in. Essentially, we have this genetically valuable girl that Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard are raising as their own, which was built up to in the last movie. And now, of course, the girl along with the good raptor's baby gets taken by the bad guys. <laughs> meaning that our investment in the plotline comes from getting her back. I'm not saying this is breaking new ground, but the stakes are tangible. They have an intimately personal effect on the hero. They're also relatively too serious. You know, it's relatively easy to take it too serious. So, you know, put a pacifier in all their mouths. Rose that drives them. They're enough for the audience to want to see this innocent girl and even to some extent the raptor baby be rescued. Why is he put like the inception? Get your damn going? hands off. Compare this to the legacy plotline, which doesn't carry any significance in terms of whether or not we succeed whatsoever. Like I mentioned, the main gist is that there are these juiced up locusts that are eating all the fields except those owned by Apple. They use biosyn seed. Yeah, I bet they do. And for various reasons, not only is this dumb, but it also just doesn't function. First off, the stakes appear so out of nowhere that it's just off-puttingly weird. In the last movie, we were building up to a problem of dinosaurs having to coexist with humanity. And now here, that's been suddenly tossed aside in favor of this. No, it hasn't. You just said that the whole Malta sequence, there's a other half of the movie that predominantly involves, well, only involves dinosaurs. You got the whole Malta sequence where we see the black market. We see how people are cooking stuff, how they like from the dinosaurs, how they're selling and fighting the dinosaurs, how they're using them for um, sort of militarized assassination attempts. <laughs> you can see the the illegal breeding farms that Zia and Claire go to at the beginning of the movie. You see how people are breeding them illegally. You see them at uh, the government attacking, uh, 
tracking the dinosaurs like with the you see that person being attacked on the beach with the dimorphodon there's there's so much in the movie the owen and claire plot to do with dinosaurs being global and their threat to them we see the biosyn airport where they were looking after them as i mentioned previously we see the the you know the biosyn sanctuary while it's a secluded location that is a t- tied to the global threat of the dinosaurs because they're shipping them there so no <laughs> frankly <laughs> you're wrong and it's like hmm we have this movie all about dinosaurs and- that you're showing people dealing with dinosaurs out in the world from the movie and then claiming that it doesn't focus on that it's like it does for half the the other half of the movie this is from the mazy storyline where we see her helping people clear the dinosaurs like it's all character building with the mazy plot line the plot line that you were just praising five seconds ago and people what should we make the stakes be about oh i know let's make them about these big insects this is big brain time no joke we got more of that human dinosaur coexistence in an ad for the f-ing olympics uh <laughs> i hate to tell you man go on dinotracker.com your mind will blow um no th- th- this is such a silly point it's like the dinosaurs coexisting. Okay, let's look at this, right? This is like the end movie of the era. So the the insect plot line is basically covering the whole immediate threat of like, okay, genetic tampering, which is a theme of this movie franchise, which has been been every single movie except the third one for the most part. It's there for a bit, but anyway. Uh, so the locust plot line is focused on the immediate threat. The dinosaurs are a threat to human and our existence on Earth because they are starting to mess up things. They are starting to, you know, go appear everywhere as we see extensively in Malta, which is like the big middle mo- part of the movie action sequence. Um, but their their threat to the human race in in living alongside us basically is a slow burn. It's gonna it, it will, it's something that's gonna take. It's not an immediate thing because these are big lumbering animals. They're not like insects that can fly and cross continents. As he shows in Dodson looking at his phone there, it says that they've just crossed continents into Europe. So they are they are embodying the genetic tampering idea gone awry in a very immediate way. And Owen and Claire are trying to look for their daughter and this other baby dinosaur whilst traversing this world of dinosaurs and humans living alongside each other. So I think this guy's got this backwards. And it is funny to see he's now attacking the half of the movie, the Owen Clare plot that he was praising a few minutes ago. And on top of that, the motivations behind the stakes don't even make any apparent sense. The movie proposes that Apple, for some reason, wants to control the world's food supply. Not before a few million stars. But then it never answers its own question. Even the villains don't seem to have any clue what they're doing or why. And if nothing and nobody in the movie is... What do you mean, why the F did I create them? He created them to eat bias and seed for Dodson. And then realized, that, hang on, that's a, that's, that's a huge mistake. It already got out. So he knows why he did it. Actively carrying the stakes, they're just gonna fall flat on the floor. It's like the stakes here are literally a mistake. You don't stop because of a, what, a little side project went south? But most importantly, the stakes aren't personal or tangible. They don't affect the heroes. It's not their cornfields. It's not the cornfields of anyone they know. They're not driven by the effects of the stakes because there is no effect. They're just trying to stop Apple because they're good guy heroes and... Uh, why not? So instead... N- no, you've repeated the same problem I addressed earlier that... It's not a why not scenario. It affects everyone. Globally. The stakes of this plotline rely solely on the usual blockbuster curse where the entire human world is a danger. These locusts in Nebraska are about to yes. wrap it up. They're eating the corn, wheat, basically all of our food and our food's food, so we can say goodbye to this. Which unfortunately doesn't function either because, oh yeah, this plotline doesn't even take place in the human world. We're in this remote valley where- It goes to the source of the problem. There's nothing wrong with that. 
But the logos problem cannot be seen or felt in any way. What do you what, what, this guy was expecting them to be what, be in trucks chasing the ch chasing the locust swarm and like shooting them with machine guns. <laughs> like or spraying them like we gotta kill them all. Shh, shh. I think Ellie says, and you might bring it up, but like Ellie says that they're breeding uncontrollably and not dying, so they're just growing in numbers way whatsoever all we get in the entire movie unforeseen f effects of the genetic tampering you're using prehistoric bug dna and that means these things are tough <laughs> it is one visit to a random farm and even there the focus is on the locusts themselves rather than the effects of the corn being in in other words the stakes are not real and neither is the audience's care of them the stakes are not real but he's showing the shot of the steak the locust itself that is the steak <laughs> that's the juicy steak <laughs> don't know how you like it medium rare <laughs> And I think the main lesson to learn here is that these big blockbusters have to stop doing these generic end of the world stakes. We don't care about the world, we only care about the people we know in it. The world is ending in real life as we speak and we can barely keep interest for over a week because it's just somewhere out there. I mean, God- No. No, no. The world is not ending. The world's doing just fine! <laughs> he shows war, sun, and COVID? <laughs> <laughs> no, the world the world is fine. It's all good. It's humans that have issues with each other. So, the what the world is completely fine. Speak, and we can barely keep interest for over a week because it's just somewhere out there. I mean, goddamn, even the people in this movie don't seem to care about the world ending. We're not gonna be around for much longer anyway. Is Locust in Nebraska about to wrap it up? Cool. And so again, if you can't make these stakes real, why feature them at all? Okay, so he said that these people don't care that the world is ending and they're just sitting there going, oh, they're just going to wrap it up like from the movie. But then he just did the exact same thing in a YouTube video. <laughs> so imagine him sat at home, re like talking into his mic and, oh, you know, the world is ending, you know, blah, 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 like recording that video. Imagine seeing that like a fly on the wall and then someone recording that and going, see, look, people just don't care about the world ending. Why don't you just let the stakes be about the villain wanting to harvest the girl's DNA for some shady reason? Why don't you just let them be about their- What the- let... Oh god, that's painful. He just complained about the locust plot and in his words basically not really having any stakes. So, you know, they're just, they're just a global threat for some reason. And then he says he wants the plot to focus on biosyn harvesting Maisie's DNA for some reason. So- even he is making the mistake of, of the, that he's complaining about. What is this video? The effects of dinosaurs and humans having to coexist. Why spend tens of minutes and millions of dollars on something that's just gonna amount to a negative? If a plotline doesn't have drama or challenge or stakes, it shouldn't exist. Not every blockbuster has to be about the end of the world. Not every blockbuster has to be two and a half hours long. Sometimes all you need to do to make your movie or book or video float is cut out the extra weight and dragging it. The world would still be facing that problem of the world ending in this plotline because of the, the dinosaurs, <laughs> right? You don't know what they're going to do and how humans are dealing with them. Down. But there's one more additional plotline, I mean, there's one more additional metaphor that will definitely make this video better. It's basically like this Jurassic World Dominion is like this wallet. It has what you need, but with all this extra unnecessary crap and poor design. Two metro cards for the New York subway system. I live in Los Angeles. You stupid. Whereas Jurassic World Dominion without the legacy plotline is like this rich wallet. It holds 